Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be too offended by it. <laughs> um, but we cover anything that may be of interest to um, anyone in the library world. Um, we do the show live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unavailable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We um, post all of our recordings, all of our shows are available on our website. Um, so you can go back and watch anything you've missed before. Um, we do a mixture of things here, um, presentations, um, interviews, mini training sessions, book reviews, basically anything library related, we are happy to have it on the show. And we have uh, the guest speakers that sometimes come in, and we have commission, Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do sessions. And this morning, we have Library Commission. <laughs> um, sitting next to me is Sally Snyder in her... Mad scientist. Mad scientist Sally Snyder oh, today, <laughs> <laughs> who is our coordinator of children and young adult um, library services here at the Library Commission. And she's here for her annual summer reading program session. Um, every year she comes on and gives us new titles um, to um, use in the summer reading program whatever theme is for each year. Um, and before I hand it over to Sally, I do want to give a little um, notification, I guess would be the word. Um, our show is officially an hour-long show, officially 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Time. However, history has proven that Sally usually goes over that in her <laughs> sessions, um, which is not a problem at all. We will keep going and recording and doing it as long as she goes. Um, just to make sure to be aware, if you need, <clears throat> do need to leave at 11 or at the, after the hour has run, gone, um, go right ahead. We'll keep recording. You'll be able to catch all the titles you missed um, at the end of the show when we um, come back later and watch the recording. Um, there's just too much to fit into one hour. It's just exactly too, right. many, too many good books out there to share. Um, so, And there is a list of the books that I'll be talking about that you can download. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. That will be added to the... Right. Sorry, there's a, there's a PDF handout of um, all the titles that will be linked to after the show on our website. You'll be able to get that in a PDF form. And these PowerPoint <coughs> slides will be available too if you want to have that um, just to see all the book covers and whatnot that are available. So everything that's being mentioned today you'll be able to get a hold of um, later. So I will just hand over to you, Sally, and you can um, take it away. Take it away. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll. this is, a, as she said, a book list for preschool through young adults. So I will work hard to get this done in an hour, but it's not going to happen because <laughs> I have a few things after the I'm done yeah, with the books. I have a couple of extra things that I think are pretty exciting for Nebraska anyway. So we'll start with, I thought that would work. There we go. Yep. Fiction picture books. There we go. Linda Ashman has written Rain. A little boy is happy and an older gentleman is grumpy when it begins to rain. And the boy gets to put on his frog hat and his raincoat. And, and um, he and his mom go outside and the older gentleman goes outside. Eventually they encounter each other with a change of attitude on the older gentleman's part. It's cut paper illustrations that add to the story. And, of course, rain is a scientific thing because it's moisture coming from the sky. Bailey at the Museum is by Harry Bliss. Barry is, Bailey is excited to join the class for their trip to the Natural History Museum. But when he sees the dinosaur skeleton, he can't stop himself from biting it a little bit. His bones, of His course. His bones, he's got to nibble. The rest of the tour, Bailey has a new partner, one of the guards. Short sentences, such as, after lunch, Bailey learns all about the Stone Age, are combined with speech bubbles that share what people are saying, and we get to see what Bailey is thinking. This is um, the second or third book about Bailey, and it's quite fun, and kids will have a good time learning about museums. What Goes Up by Paula Bowles. The scientific principle of gravity gives the dragon Martin trouble. Martin wants to fly, but his wings are too small, and he can't get off the ground. He tries copying other animals and items, but still no luck. The children of the town love him and join him in running and flapping his wings every day. Soon, his wings begin to grow, and to grow stronger. Beep and Baw by James Burks. Ba, a blue sheep who only says, Ba, finds a lone athletic sock and takes it to his friend Beep, a robot who talks a lot. Eager for adventure, Beep declares they must find the match to the sock, and off they go through a somewhat bizarre landscape, as you can see on the cover there. They meet up with various animals who each have their own ideas or opinions about the sock. The encounter with the chicken is particularly fun. When asked if the sock belongs to him, he says, The sky is falling! Someone after my own heart as a mad scientist. 
But Beep and Bob missed the fact that um, Chicken does have it right. This is perfect for this coming summer. Mm -hmm. Awesome Dawson by Chris Gall. Dawson collects junk and uses it to, cre to create new spectacular things. His motto is, everything can be used again. But when he invents a robot to do his chores, something goes wrong and it is demolishing the town. How can Dawson stop it? Great fun looking at all the labeled items in Dawson's bedroom and in his workroom. And it's a perfect time to read the story and then pull out all the leftovers you have and have the kids make something out of all the junk. Build Dogs Build, A Tall Tale by James Horvath. Science is involved in building construction and these dogs are on the job. From tearing down the former building, the crane is in place, the angle's correct, get the ball swinging now, wreck dogs wreck. To laying the foundation and constructing the new building, lots of energy and equipment is included. The Mischievians by William Joyce. A brother and sister send a note on a balloon asking for help since so many items have been disappearing from their home. Unexpectedly, they are sucked down a tube and land in a laboratory. Dr. Zuper explains their problems are caused by mischievians. He shows them a book that gives information and an illustration of many different types of mischievians. Clever and fun, and maybe the listeners, of course, can draw their own version of a mischievian after the story. Mousetronaut by Mark Kelly. Meteor is smaller than the other mice training for a mission in space, but he is dedicated to the preparation. Meteor, one of six mice selected for the trip, enjoys floating in space. The other mice are all hanging on to the sides of the cage, and Meteor is just kind of taking it easy. <laughs> then he finds a way to help the astronauts because he is so small he can fit in a tight place the astronauts can't reach. It's a fun look at space and the value of being small. And as it says inside the front cover, I believe, based on a partially true story, the afterword explains that um, astronaut Mark Kelly did go up in space with a cage of mice, and one of them did just kind of float there, woo -woo -woo, and all the rest were hanging on to the side. <laughs> and that kind of prompted a story to fall. Nice. Fun. Dinosauring by Deb Lund. Okay, not so technically correct about flying an airplane, but great fun for the preschool to lower elementary crowd. Rhyming text uses created words such as dino goggles and dino plan. The third book, this is the third book about this colorful dinosaur crew, and it will especially appeal to fans of the previous titles, Dino Sailors and All Aboard the Dino Train. If you want to go a little bit more technically correct, Planes Fly by George Ella Lyon has simple rhyming text that tells of several types of planes flights, a quick look at instrumentation, and a child's trip on a commercial airliner. An example of the text, some hold lobsters, racehorses too, some hold the president, some hold you, and that will be great for story time. As you would expect, this is a reimagining of the three little pigs. It's called The Three Little Aliens and the Big Bad Robot by <laughs> Margaret McNamara. You may want to read both stories together to ensure the listeners are familiar with the original story, but you're going to want to practice this one before you read it aloud to a group of kids because... The aliens are named Bork, Gork, and I say Nicklewitz, <laughs> N-K-L-X-W-C-Y-Z. So, you know, work on your pronunciation and you'll be good to go. It's great fun. Pluto Visits Earth by Steve Metzger. Pluto is irked that he has been downgraded to a dwarf planet, so he is on his way to Earth to tell those astronomers to reconsider. I agree. He, he, okay, <laughs> we've got a... A uh, proponent for you there, Pluto. He asks some of the other planets for help, but they all decline. When he reaches the Mount Bali Observatory, it is a small boy who helps him accept his new status. Clever illustrations add fun to the story with things like a spaceship piloted by a dog, while a snowman tethered to the ship goes on a walk in space. And you can look there and you can see a dog going after a bone mm -hmm. on the cover there. Um, kids will enjoy finding these interesting things in the, in the artwork, too. The final page contains, contains factual information about the discovery of Pluto and why his status changed. So, yeah, we'll see what we decide about that. Oliver by Judith Russell has curiosity, experimenting, and exploring all wrapped up in one book. He makes wings to try flying, and I think he really does try flying because he has some trouble. And then he explores down the bathtub drain in his fabricated cardboard box submarine to find out what's gurgling down there. 
And I think that happens while really while he's imagining all that part while he's taking a bath. But it's great fun, and he goes to a whole different land with um, some little penguins that help him get back to his bathtub. This is hilarious. Robot Zombie Frankenstein by Annette Simon. <laughs> And I wish I had to take the book back yesterday because it was due at the library. Uh, otherwise, I'd read the whole thing to you right now, so <laughs> count yourself lucky. Two robots of different shapes and colors compete with each other, starting with robot, robot. And then one zips away and comes back and says, robot, zombie, because you can see he's got some zombie aspects there. And then the next one zooms away and comes back, robot, zombie, Frankenstein. And they go on through the book. It's very... If those are the only words, big color, as you can see on the cover here, big color illustrations. And they finally end with Robot Zombie Frankenstein Pirate Superhero in Disguise Outer Space Invader Chef <laughs> with pie. And the pie makes them friends. They share a piece of pie. An, a newer book by her, Ro, um, Annette Simon, Robot, Robot Burphead Smarty Pants. Kids love body noises, and this book is a competition, this time about burping. Burp while reciting the numbers, burp by, while counting by tens. Throw in the alphabet, and you have a competition. You can expect a lot of burps while you're reading this or after you're finished at story time. Be, be prepared. Be ready for that, <laughs> yes, as you well know, I'm sure. Robomop by Sean Taylor. Robomop's job is to clean a bathroom in a basement. He does a good job every day, but he longs to see more of the world. He is not designed to go upstairs, so his world is very small. One day, the inspector brings a new female-looking biomorphic bellbot cleanerette, a friend. But Robomop is taken upstairs and put in the trash can. Is there any hope for him? This is a fun, upbeat story about having dreams and finding they have come true. You also have Robot Rumpus by Sean Taylor. This book is my dream. There is a robot for every duty, every job in the household. Each robot has that particular job. That would be awesome. So yeah. you see the ones cleaning the dog. There's another robot there with a toothbrush. I don't know if it's for the dog or for you. <laughs> but anyway, but there's a disagreement. Someone steps over the line, and we have quite the robot rumpus. There is a hullabaloo before things settle down again. So there are some drawbacks to having a robot for every job, apparently. Randy Riley's really big hit by Chris Van Dusen. Randy loves science and baseball. He is not very good at baseball since he is distracted by scientific thoughts while he's at bat. He's thinking trajectory and speed, and then the ball goes by him. He didn't swing. But when he discovers a flaming ball heading through space toward his town, he gets to calculating and constructing something to save the day. So you want Randy on your team, actually. Some picture book nonfiction. Salamander, Frog, and Pollywogs. What is an Amphibian by Brian P. Cleary is part of a series called Animal Groups Are Categorical. And this is the only book I've seen from this series, but it, it does a good job of going through and talking about these particular animals and other animals and what is it that puts them together in this group called Amphibian. And so you can learn about that. I love this book, Bone by Bone by Sarah Levine. Using a question and answer format, this book asks the reader things like, what animal would you be if your finger bones grew so long that they reached your feet? Do you have a guess? I didn't know. Um, a gorilla? I don't know. Good guess, but it's a bat. Because bat. the finger bones on a bat are in their wings. what's in their wings. Ah. Yeah. And they ask, what would you be if you had no arm or leg bones? You'd be a snake. Oh, yeah. Okay, no so each like time that. they ask the question, they show an outline of a human, and then these whatever bones they're talking about are taken away or added in some cases. And then you guess, and the next page shows you what that's. Okay, actually, yeah. As you can see, it's a stylized drawing of the mm -hmm. skeleton, but you get the idea of the skeleton makeup of all kinds of different animals and why they are that way. It's a good look at anatomy and about an important part of our bodies. Um, Rocks and Minerals by Kathleen Widener Zofeld is a uh, National Geographic kids book. It's a level two beginning reader introducing minerals and the three rock groups. It includes clear and excellent photographs as you'd expect and it's a good start for young rock fans. So some beginning reader and early chapter books that match the theme. 
Fly Guy and the Frankenfly by Ted Arnold is the 13th book in this series. It is Fly Guy as a mad scientist. I love it. One two-page spread shows him wearing a lab coat and goggles with two beakers and tubes dripping liquid. He is creating Frankenfly. It does turn out that he's just having a dream. <laughs> Rabbit and Robot the Sleepover by C.C. Bell. We talked about them when the theme was um, the nighttime theme, but this works again because of Robot. Unlikely friends, Rabbit is hosting Robot for their first sleepover. Rabbit has written a list of things they will do and surprises Robot with it when he arrives. They have different tastes and likes, which becomes evident as the evening moves on. Rabbit likes carrots and snow peas on his pizza. Robot likes nuts and bolts on his. Lots of fun, and readers will enjoy the fact that they are able to work things out. I didn't see this series when it first came out, and it's just so great for this coming summer. The first book in the series, Franny K. Stein, Mad Scientist, by Jim Benton, is titled Lunch Walks Among Us. Franny is different. She loves bats and spiders and keeping her room dark and spooky. She hates ponies and daisies and mm. pink. She is a self-proclaimed mad scientist. She and her family have just moved and Franny is starting a new school, but the other kids are frightened of her. Franny agrees with her teacher to try an experiment to get the other kids to be her friends. It has a gentle message about being yourself that is combined with one or two illustrations on every two-page spread. And kids will, kids will enjoy Franny's unique approach to life. The second book in the same series is titled Attack of the 50-Foot Cupid, the most fun thing, and this one's fun too, but the thing I liked best about this book is that her mother, who hasn't been very supportive, gets her a lab assistant, and Franny's all excited until she finds out it's a mixed breed dog with some Labrador in it. <laughs> However, he really does want to assist her, and he understands what's going on. So there are seven books altogether in this series. The last one, The Friend to Date, came out in 2007, but you can still buy them here and there on the internet, so they might be, you know, in paperback, they might be a good addition to your collection for the summer. Fetch with Ruff Ruffman, Doggy Duties. This is a, a book based on the series on PBS called, you know, Fetch with Ruff Ruffman. And uh, this is the first book I've seen. I think there's a couple of others available. In this one, Ruff accidentally broke his toilet and he has to go. When he learns NASA builds toilets for space, he wants one of those. But the last one just went into space with the astronauts. Ruff is appalled when he discovers that the astronauts drink recycled pee. The kids will, or some of the kids will love that and yes. some will hate it. This book is silly and fun, but it also has an experiment at the back of the book for readers to try filtering water with a, a two-liter pop bottle and, and some rocks and things. Um, they do mention that the water that they will get from re this doing, using this experiment is not as clean as the, the water on the spacecraft, just so you're sure of that. Zig and Wiki in the Cow by Ma Naju Spiegelman. This is the second book about Zig and Wiki. The first one was Zig and Wiki in Something Ate My Homework, which also includes some science facts about nature. Each book has that because um, you can see the cow is eating a couple of little guys. The reddish guy is Zig, and Wiki is the kind of light yellow guy who's kind of square. And Wiki has like a com computer screen on his face where he finds out facts about things, and then they know what they're supposed to do. Okay, so Zig took a fly as a pet after their first visit to Earth, but the fly is sick, and so they must return. They learn that a farm with cows is the best place for the fly, but they have a few unexpected adventures on the farm. And as I said, the story includes some science facts. And one of them, when they get eaten, then you see an outline of a cow, and you see the stomachs and, and what, where all they're going to go they're throughout going. there and where they're going to come out eventually. The kids will love that, too. Okay, my wig is getting a little <laughs> warm and itchy, so we'll go without it now. Um, fiction for grades 2 to 5 or 6 or so. The first book on this list is The Surprise Attack of Jabba the Puppet by Tom Engelberger. This is book four in the um, Origami Yoda series. And I'm so excited whenever a favorite series fits a theme because mm -hmm. I can talk about that book again. It brings a gathering of students who plan to resist the principal's new approach to improving the school's test scores, an insipid, boring video called Fun Time. 
The book mentions sci the science fair, and the chapter on page 37 is titled Scientific Evidence, which introduces Harvey's plan to measure the effects of fun time by charting his score and his cousin's score for the same video game. His cousin goes to a different school. They don't have fun time. His proposal is that his score is going to continue to go down while his cousins might go up. Then they report the evidence several times in the book until Harvey's father points out that the experiment is bad science with too small of a sample size. So you get these science things thrown mm -hmm. in there. Along with the fact that, yes, at the back of the book, you, they show you how to fold a job as a puppet and some Ewoks. And Princess Leia is the next book. I can't remember. I forgot to check if it's out yet. It's coming. Henri Bell is living with his great aunt when he begins to notice something strange. He can understand what insects are saying. He joins a flea circus and eventually goes on a mission to find his father since he disappeared in British Malaya. And he is also, while he's there, going to look for the mythical insect, Goliathus Hercules. And by the way, he is apparently turning into that insect as well. A little bit of science fiction with our story. It is uh, Racing the Moon by Alan Armstrong. It is 1947, and Alex, whose full name is Alexis, she's 11, and her older brother Chuck, who's 17, are completely fascinated by the idea of rockets and trips into space, especially to Mars. Alex meets their new neighbor, and soon the neighbor is mentoring the two of them for their interest in the space program. Chuck is irresponsible in his efforts to try new things, but he is slowly reined in by others. It is highly improbable, but that won't stop readers interested in the time period. Um, a little bit older Ivy and Bean book. Ivy and Bean, What's the Big Idea by Sophie Blackall. This is number seven in the series. It's science fair time. The second grade class is going to join the school science fair with ideas to help alleviate global warning, warming. Ivy and Bean are enthusiastic. They just can't come up with an idea. And I love that they have goggles and and test tubes right there on the cover is fun. Cosmic by Frank Cottrell Boyce. Liam is 12 years old, but he is tall and he has some beard fuzz starting. He's frustrated because his height makes people think he is older and that he should know better. A series of circumstances put him on an experimental rocket with four children. He is supposed to be the responsible adult. Something has gone wrong and they are continuing out into space with no way to get home. Liam is recording the story to his parents on his cell phone. They think he is attending a gifted and talented week in the Lake District. It's humorous and at times touching. They do make it back home okay. I just have to tell you that because I worry. This is another series I didn't catch when it first came out. Popular Clone is the first book. It's by M.E. Castle, and the series is called The Clone Chronicles. Twelve-year-old Fisher Boss is the son of two scientists who are sometimes overly busy with their projects. Fisher is regularly bullied by the Vikings, a trio of trouble. To save himself the trials of school, he creates a, slump, a clone to suffer the abuse while he stays home with his inventing, his uh, notes, his TV and video games. Imagine his surprise when his clone actually makes friends and seems to be becoming popular. <laughs> It's interspersed with drawings of brainstorming ideas, inventions he is testing, and diagrams of the school. The second book is Clone Word Bound. Two, he calls his clone Two. Two is off in Hollywood being discovered, and Fisher is going on a class trip to Hollywood, and he plans to bring Two home. The family is in trouble since the government discovered that one centiliter of the AGH his mother invented is missing. That's what he used to create the clone, and he didn't tell anybody. Two is not eager to come back home. And book three, titled Game of Clones, <laughs> came out in February. So I haven't seen that one yet. The Secret Science Alliance and the Copycat Crook by Eleanor Davis is a graphic novel story. Julian Calendar 11 is a short, red-headed science geek. He is starting over at a different middle school and is determined to look dumb to keep from being bullied but he keeps forgetting he's supposed to be dumb and answering questions. He answers questions. Super Jock Ben and Dangerous Greta turn out to be science fans, and soon they form the Secret Science Alliance, complete with a hideout and an invention notebook. But when Professor Stringer apparently steals their invention notebook and invents an item from it, the team is determined to get it back. 
this graphic novel encourages learning and science. And I looked around, but there isn't another uh, follow-up book. And this story is complete in itself, but you kind of feel like there should be another be nice one. nice to see they do more things, yeah. yeah. Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library by Chris Grabenstein. Mr. Lemoncello, the greatest inventor of games ever, is thrilled to share the new public library with the 12, 12-year-old 12 winning essay writers eager to spend their lock-in at the library. The children are given a puzzle to solve to win a special prize, and they slowly begin to form groups. Holograms, lasers, video communication, and crazy inventions abound in this book. Owen Foote, Mighty Scientist by Stephanie Green. Owen is in third grade, and he and his best friend Joseph once again are partners for the science fair. This year, Owen wants a top-notch idea in order to attract the attention of fourth grade teacher Mr. Wozniak, because he really concentrates on science in his classroom. But something goes terribly wrong with their experiment, and they have to decide if there's anything they can do about it. Another series I didn't run into, you know, this is a, a theme going on here. George and the Big Bang by Lucy and Stephen Hawking is book three and the final book in the series. And it stands alone because I read it without reading the first two, and, and the story uh, carries very well. George and his friend Annie have traveled via a portal to other parts of the solar system thanks to her dad, Eric, and his supercomputer, Cosmos. When Eric is accused of misuse of Cosmos and sent to the site of the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, on the border of Switzerland and France, France, the kids find out that a bomb has been placed there to take out both the LHC and the group of scientists. George and, I, and Annie have to find a wormhole to get there and hopefully defuse the bomb. Scientific explanations are interspersed within the text, and it fits very nicely within the story. The other titles are George's Secret Key to the Universe and George's Cosmic Treasure Hunt, if you want to check out the whole series. And yes, that is Stephen Hawking, the guy you're thinking of, yeah. and his daughter, and Lucy. His daughter, yeah. That's cool. Baby Mouse, Mad Scientist, by Jennifer L. Holm and Matthew Holm. Irrepressible daydreaming baby mouse must find a good idea for the science fair. During class, the scientific method is explained, and Baby Mouse becomes the unwitting subject of an experiment about her whiskers. She gets some water from the pond and puts a drop on the slide for her new microscope. That is how she meets the amoeba Squish, who becomes her, her project. He eats cupcakes, and this is Squish's first appearance because guess what? He gets his own book. <laughs> oh, these are gra both graphic novels. Squish, Super Amoeba, is the first book in the series, also by Jennifer L. and Matthew Holm. He may live in a pond, but he has a lot of the same troubles as kids. Elementary school assignments, bullies, mystifying school lunches, principal planaria, Peggy, a constantly upbeat paramecium. There's a bit of science thrown in occasionally, and all of the creatures in his school are different types of microscopic life from the pond. So you meet a paramecium and the planaria, etc. And you can talk about that if the kids want to find out more about what is an amoeba or a paramecium. Brave New Pond is the second book in the series. I've read, um, there's five out so far, and I, I couldn't get a hold of the fourth book, but I've read the rest, and they uh, continue the theme of really being about middle school or elementary school school problems with different microorganisms. So you've got your hydra there, the power of the parasite. And book five is where he's um, addicted to his video game, which you can see there in the book. It's called Squish Game On. And these are all on the list, so you don't have to worry about jotting down all the titles. Another graphic novel. This is the first book in a new series, Lunch Lady and the Cyborg Substitute by Jarrett J. Krosokzak. Uh -oh, Sorry, I didn't practice that ahead of time. <laughs> I practiced the other one, but... Lunch Lady and her co-worker Betty secretly protect school students and staff, and on the side they foil bank robberies. When the new substitute teacher behaves suspiciously, Lunch Lady is on the job. Students Hector, Terrence, and Dee are accidentally pulled into the cage, case and add a touch of help as well. I mentioned this is book one, and this particular book will work well for next summer, 2015, because that theme is Every Hero Has a Story. So you can buy it for this summer, and if it lasts, if I have it in paperback. I didn't check to see if it was available in hardback. Mm -hmm. It'll say on the list if it is. Brother from a Box by Evan Kuhlman is about a boy who gets home. From, he's an only child. He gets home from school, and his parents are still at work, 
and there's this crate that's been delivered. Well, what does any kid do when there's a crate? They open it up. Inside there is a robot. It says robot brother. And at first he speaks French until the boy keeps telling him, I don't speak French. He switches to English. It turns out that the, the boy's father and his brother, the boy's uncle, who lives in France, they have been developing these robots and they each have one. And they find out that there are some unsavory characters trying to find out the technology that they've used for mm -hmm. these robots and they're not above kidnapping and worse. So there's some danger. Hide and Shriek by David Lubar is book one in a monsterific tale series. There are six expected. Jackie Clevis is a science teacher for K through sixth grade and she's preparing for the upcoming science fair. She's a good teacher and always tells her students to be very careful with chemicals. However, she accidentally gets an unknown substance, substance in her coffee and she changes to Ms. Hyde, a horrible substitute teacher. She learns that when people are nice to her, she changes into a little girl. When they are upset or mean, she changes back into Ms. Hyde. She needs to find a way to become Jackie Clevis, the teacher, again. And another book by David Lubar is Numbed. This is kind of a companion title to Punished. I haven't read Punished, but people tell me they're similar. In Numbed, the sixth grade class visits the Mobius, Mobius Mathematics Museum. And when Logan and Benedict fall behind, a robot zaps their math skills. Now they must go back for several days to pass a series of math challenges to retrieve their knowledge. Readers can try to solve the challenges as they read along, or they can just keep reading and find out the answer. But it's kind of a fun puzzle challenge, too. Pie in the Sky by Wendy Moss. A fantasy filled with science, as School Library Journal says, entertaining, unexpected, and irreverent, and yet packed with information about elemental physics and the contents of the universe. All in this fictional story. Joss is the seventh son of the supreme overlord of the universe, and his job is to deliver pies. Special pies, but he is still a delivery boy. When Earth disappears, it is up to Joss to rebuild it exactly as it was. And um, he has some help from a girl who lives on Earth, but happened to be in his space when Earth disappeared. And maybe she can help him a little bit. I love this title. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin Stein Lives awesome. by Matthew McElligot and Larry Tuxbury. I love all those mashups of yes. different. <laughs> it's a great mashup. <clears throat> and I'm sorry I didn't write down the name of the boy. A uh, boy and his mother live in an apartment house. And he's discovered this kind of um, behind a bookcase, this secret lab, so to speak. And one evening, there's this huge flash of what he thinks is lightning. It hits the lightning rod in the house, and it travels through the house down to the basement. And he goes down there, and he finds this this um, big, I don't want to call it, I can't remember what they call it. Anyway, Benjamin Franklin is in it, and he's been in suspended animation all this time, and uh, this big bolt of lightning or whatever it was has woken him up, reanimated him. Mm -hmm. And you can see, if you look at the picture, he has bolts on the side of his neck, and he needs a little battery pack that the boy invents for him. <laughs> so he can uh, stay charged up and, and walk around. And um, so we learn a lot about Benjamin Franklin while, while this is going on, but also they learn that someone is trying to take over the world, and they're awakening, they're awakening the scientists who have been put in animation to try and pull them over to their side and, and defeat everybody else. So this is the first book. The second book is Benjamin Franklin Stein Meets the Fright Brothers, mm -hmm. which I couldn't get a copy of, but I did get a hold of the third one. Benjamin Franklin Stein meets Thomas Dedison, which is the last book in this series. It completes the story. And, of course, Thomas has been pulled in by the evil. The evil guy turns out to be Napoleon. Oh, oh yeah. But don't worry. At the end, he regains himself and saves the day. As I've said before, every summer reading program theme, there is a Magic Treehouse book to, to line up with it. So... Monday with a Mad Genius by Mary Pope Osborne is the number 38 in the series. And this is the day that they spend with Leonardo da Vinci, and they do get a glimpse of his creativity, his in inventions, some of his notebooks, about all the things he was thinking of. The, as for the cover, since Leonardo wanted to fly so much, Annie used the wand of Dianthus to make it happen for a, a short time. So the cover doesn't really show what the story is about, but it's, um, those are all great fun. This is a new series that I did get a hold of right away. Yay. 
but this is book two. Book one was about zombies. This one is titled Making the Team by Scott Savage. And the title of the series is Case File Number 13. Another mysterious case is encountered by sixth grade friends Carter, Nick, and Angelo. This time they team up with their girl rivals. They had been working against each other in the zombie story. They face a mad scientist with Frankenstein-like creations. There are bad odors, danger, and going back to save a friend in this story. I'm not sure how many books will be in this series, but we have two so far. The Storm Makers by Jennifer E. Smith, 12-year-old twins Ruby and Simon have moved to a farm in Wisconsin with their parents. Now, instead of doing everything together, Simon goes off on his own. But it isn't until Simon is ill and the weather is wild that Ruby meets a strange man who knows something special about Simon. He is the newest and youngest storm makers. Storm maker. Um, this combines science and magic, and another side story is that their father is working on an invention in the barn, and Ruby loves science, and she's helping him. So that's all part of that. I've come to believe that there is a Geronimo Stilton book for everything. <laughs> this is Mouse in Space by Geronimo Stilton, and it's number 52 in the series. Geronimo, who is a bit of a fraidy cat, is secret agent 00G, and he travels into space with agents 00K and 00B to thwart a villain intent on stealing a mountain of gold coins and taking over the city. And once again, it is told with many illustrations and a colorful emphasis on selected words to add appeal to young readers. A Boy and His Bot by Daniel H. Wilson. <clears throat> Code Lightfall is in sixth grade, and he falls through a hole at the mound site when he and his class are on a field trip. He finds himself in the world of Mechos, where there are robots of all kinds. With two new robot friends, Code sets off to find his grandfather, who disappeared almost a year ago. And he is also trying to save Mechos from being destroyed. While on his quest, Code learns a few things about being proactive and stepping up when he's needed. Some nonfiction for grades 2 to 5 or 6. I'm going to take a quick drink. Thank you. Timeless Thomas by Jean Beretta is a quick look at some of the inventions of Thomas Edison, coupled with how they have been adapted for today. So that's kind of fun to see that. Mm -hmm. Cartoon-like like art gives the reader an ever-smiling Edison and energetic contemporary kids. And there's not a peep in this book that Thomas might have had his bad days or been hard to work with sometimes, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't need to say that. Electric Ben by Robert Byrd is a 2013 Boston Globe Hornbook Award winner for nonfiction. Byrd tells the life of Benjamin Franklin in two page spreads that each address a particular time or issue in his life. So they, in, they investigate his scientific inventions and another uh, two page spread tells about electricity. Um, lively illustrations add to the text. The Mystery of Darwin's Frog by Marty Crump a small frog discovered by Darwin puzzled scientists before they discovered that the male frog swallows the tadpoles into his vocal sac to keep them there for two months until they emerge as frogs. The title also discusses a fungus that is now threatening the frog and efforts to save it from extinction. And this book does include an index. Becoming Ben Franklin by Russell Friedman, as you would expect, is an excellent book about ben, Ben's life from talks about his birth and, and when he was an apprentice to his brother, how he chafed under his brother's authority and so ran, basically ran off to set up his own printing company um, in another city and goes through his, his um, love of science, his uh, political career, and um, the different aspects that we've come to, come to know have made up Ben Franklin. This series, You Wouldn't Want to Be Sir Isaac Newton by Ian Graham, is, this one is just as fun and informative as all the others. I, I love the, this approach to nonfiction in that they have good information in there, but they also have snide comments and, and goofy illustrations to make it a little bit that more makes fun. It interesting to people, yeah. yeah. Or interesting to kids. More appealing, yeah. This series, Chemistry, Getting a Big Reaction, this particular title was written by Dan Green. It's part of the Basher Science series. And I have read this book, and I almost understood it. I was so <laughs> close. I let chemistry scare me in high school, and I ran away from it to, to Spanish class. But this uh, gives a good overview. 
and an introduction to chemistry. It's divided into chapters by concepts such as basic states, bright sparks, early earthy resources, and so readers will have a taste of the wide field of chemistry and a beginning look at the elements involved. There is no chart in this book. There is a chart in another book. There are um, ten titles that I know of so far in this series, physics, biology, astronomy, and more. So take a look and see which ones you might want to add to your collection for this coming summer. They're so cute. You have to, you know, you have to give those books a try. <laughs> a History of Just About Everything by Elizabeth McLeod. Starting in 6 million BC and moving forward to 2011, this book includes lots of inventions and scientific discoveries. It does have an index. There's plenty of photos and topics and illustrations to catch readers' interest. It's definitely a browser's book where you flip through and see um, different things that, that they touch on. It does go in chronological order is what I was trying to say. So you start at 6,000 BC and go up to 2011. I have several different books that are browser books on the list. But Mythbusters, a science fair book by Samantha, Samantha Margles, this is set up as a, as a Mythbuster premise. The experiments either prove, the disprove, or leave the statement still in question. And it has ideas from making your own magnet to observe colorful transformations from transpiration. It's the name of that section, but really that's about colored water and white flowers. You know, we've all done that. Mm -hmm. That title, though. Boy, sounds impressive. <laughs> it give, each, each experiment gives a list of items needed, plus a section that notes why the experiment did what it did. I like it that it explains it. There's lots of ideas to ponder or try, and it does include an index. And so if you have kids who have science fairs and looking for ideas, or you just want to try some ideas in your library, this book is a good, good suggestion. Or you can go with the Star Wars version. Star Wars Science Fair Book, again by Samantha Margles. This connects the experiments with the Star Wars movies. For example, Grow Your Own Crystals on page 79 connects with Luke needing a new crystal for his new lightsaber. The, it lists again what is needed for the experiment, gives an idea of the cost, and of the level of expertise needed. In this book, Yoda reveals the secret why the experiment did what it did. And it does include photos from the movies and an index. The Case of the Vanishing Honeybees, A Scientific Mystery by Sandra Markle <clears throat> is just that. The author talks about how beekeepers have come out and just, these are mostly about the beekeepers who move their bees from place to place throughout the year. They have come out and found their bees not just all dead, but all gone, disappeared, completely vanished. Excuse me. And they did some studying between the the bees that are moved around and the bees who don't move around, their natural lifestyle, to discover a few things that were happening with the bees they were moving that could be contributing to this issue. So they did some things that made differences and have improved the bees' life cycle and lifestyle, if you want to see that. But they're not sure they've quite captured everything that might have caused this issue. Fascinating look at scientists studying bees. 5,000 Awesome Facts About Everything by National Geographic. Do you need to know more? <laughs> this has um, scientific facts, uh, history, lots of different things thrown in here. Um, but it's, it's a great browser book. And again, kids will find something for them. Whatever kid is looking will find something. We go to the National Geographic Almanac 2014, which again has lots of different things in it. This is divided into sections like Amazing Animals and Super Science. This collection has something, again, for everyone. It does include an index, so if you're looking for something in particular, you can find out right away if this book covers it. Electrical Wizard, How Nikola Tesla Lit Up, lit up the World by Elizabeth Roosh. And this has a picture book look to it. It's about the size and shape of a picture book. But it talks about Tesla and about how he was studying science in his home country, which I should remember, but I can't think of it right now, and how he came to the U.S. hoping that he and Edison could be, if not um, partners, at least um, collaborators and, and um, bounce ideas off each other. But Edison wanted nothing to do with Nikola Tesla, so he, w he went his own way, and Tesla is the one who came up with the alternating current. So on the cover there, we see him holding this big ball of light, 
he used to do um, demonstrations for crowds to earn money where he learned how to handle the electricity, the alternating current electricity, so he didn't get injured. Yeah. And um, Edison stayed with the direct current, as mm -hmm. we know. So I, I'm, I'm really glad that I found a, a book that hits Nikola Tesla pretty well, because lots of books go Edison, and then we right. don't hear anymore. And there, you know, there is a big, there are people who are on both sides of Tesla or Edison, like fans. Good point. <laughs> Very yes. strongly on one or the other, yeah. Um, I looked up, it says he's uh, from Croatia. So. Croatia, thank you. I, I know it said in the book. <laughs> Here's another um, science experiments theory series. There's a couple of books that um, I saw from this. Science Experiments That Surprise and Delight by Sherry Bell Raywolf and Science Experiments That Fizz and Bubble by Joey Wheeler Toppin. Both of these are um, just what you would expect. They have good experiments that have cautions, when to be careful, when to ask for help, how to do the experiment, and um, hopefully have a good result. So these are excellent science fair books for kids as well. Scaly Spotted Feathered Frilled by Katherine Simish um, talks about the discoveries of skin impressions found in fossils, dinosaur footprints, and other things like feather impressions found in fossils as well. So we have skin impressions and we have feather impressions with skeletons. So we have ideas about what animals look like that we didn't know before. So the fun thing about this book is that they take some artist concepts from either like 1850s or 1901 and say, here's what we thought then that this particular animal looked like, like the iguanodon. And here's what we think now based on other things that we've discovered. And you can see what a big difference there is between the two. And then they also mention, we don't know everything yet. No. So we might, you know, there might be another book in 50 years to say, look at what they thought in 2014. <laughs> oh boy, were they wrong. Oops. Time for Kids has a science almanac. And it is, again, a, a browser's book with lots of different ideas. The thing about this is it's all science, which you might want to go that direction instead of the National Geographic, it's completely up to you, but this is another great look at all kinds of things in the science field, things that kids might want to, to just thumb through and find out. Marsha Williams has written Hooray for Inventors, over 100 inventions with a graphic novel approach to nonfiction. This does include an index as well, and it has lots of energy and snippets of information. So kids will read this, and if they find somebody fascinating, they're going to have to go somewhere else to really get the whole story but they've got a good start right here. Spark a Reaction is the teen theme for this coming summer. And Fiction for Younger Teens includes, again, another series I didn't see when it first came out. NERDS stands for National Espionage Rescue and Defense Society. And nice. these books are by Michael Buckley. Yeah. <laughs> Book one is about, it's just titled NERDS. Jackson Jones is in the fifth grade. He is a football hero and one of the most popular kids at school. Then he has to get braces with headgear. His fall is epic. Now on the bottom of the heap, he is bored by school, and he spends his time observing the teachers and the kids. When he discovers a secret lair in the school, he is asked to join five classmates whose apparent drawbacks are actually their strengths. And who would suspect a kid of anything anyway? His teammates are not happy. He used to bully them when he was popular. But they must work together to stop jo Dr. Jigsaw from reuniting the continents and causing mass destruction. It's fun with high-tech gadgets and gizmos, even from the braces in um, Jackson's mouth. The braces can extend themselves and reach out. He, when his hands are tied, the braces save him by reaching out and, and getting him out of his, his um, dilemma. Book two was titled M is for Mama's Boy. And the way it looks to me, I've only read book one. It looks like each book is about a different, focuses on a different um, main kid in the, in the group. And book five is Attack of the Bullies. So I have those, all the titles listed on the handout that you can find um, later on connected with this yep. Encompass Live. Geeks, Girls, and Secret Identities by Mike Young or Jung. Vincent and his two best friends live in Copper Plate City, the home of Captain Stupendous, the best superhero in the world. So this is another one that could be for next year as well. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. 
The three friends have studied everything they could about Captain S, including his most often used battling techniques. When Polly, Vincent's crush, receives Captain S's powers as the prior recipient is dying, the threesome offer to teach her all she needs to know to be successful. Just in time to face the mad scientist, Professor Mayhem. He's a bad one, that guy. And I think there's going to be more in this series, but I haven't found anything more about it yet. Gordon Corman has written The Hypnotists. Jack's opus is 12, and he is descended from two powerful hypnotist bloodlines, but he has just begun to realize how he can control other people's actions with sometimes frightening results. And there is a Sencha Institute where they're studying how people can do this, and that's the science part of this. Well, I'm not saying that hypnotism is science. I'm not saying it isn't. Just saying that's why the science aspect is included here. But Jackson has become concerned because the head of the Sencha Institute has plans for his abilities, and they're not good plans. The Cloak Society, Villains Rising by Jeremy Kratz. Oh, wait, that's the second one. Just The Cloak Society by Jeremy Kratz is the first book in this series. Alex Knight is 12, and he is a junior member of the Cloak Society. They are evil. He is ready for his first encounter with the Rangers of Justice, who are good. But during the battle, Alex instinctively saves the life of a junior member of the Rangers. He is stunned by his behavior and, and can't figure out how it happened. His best friend, Gabe, is a tech genius inventing lots of high-tech tools for the supervillains, and there's your science aspect, until he joins with I, Alex to work for good against all they have ever known. The second book, Villains Rising, also by Jeremy Kratz, the big battle at the end of book one left all the adult rangers of justice lost in the gloom, an alternate universe. Alex, who has telekinesis, Kirby, a shape shapeshifter, and Gabe, the tech genius, from the first book are hiding out and they are joined by two other junior rangers and one other former, former junior cloak member. They are working together on a plan to rescue the adult rangers and overcome cloak, who now rules all of the city. Book three, The Cloak Society, Fall of Heroes, comes out in September. And again, this series will be great for this summer and next summer. This Dark Endeavor by Kenneth Oppel. Victor Frankenstein, as a teen, he's 15, and he has a twin brother, Conrad, who becomes very ill. Victor, his cousin Elizabeth, who he fancies, and his best friend Henry seek ingredients listed in a hidden book, planning to save Conrad's life. The sequel, Such Wicked Intent, came out in August of 2012. I, I didn't get my hands on a copy of that. But thinking of um, Frankenstein, or the Victor Frankenstein as a 15-year-old, was, mm -hmm. was a good read. Revolution 19 by Greg Rosenblum. Ever since the robots took over 20 years ago, some families have managed to live in small communities in the wild, hiding from the robots. Nick, 17, Cass, 15, and Kevin, 13, have only known the forest and a small group of people. But when the robots finally attack them, the siblings get away, however their parents are captured. And they decide to walk to the nearest city to try and rescue their parents. They um, find that, that uh, they know nothing about how people are living in the city. They're living under the rule of the robots, but they seem to be just having normal lives. Mm -hmm. The sequel came out in January, Fugitive X, but I haven't read it yet. Lenny Cyrus School Virus by Joe Schreiber. Lenny is 13 and he has loved Zoe, who's 14, since the third grade. Now he has discovered a way to win her affections. He shrinks himself and enters her bloodstream, intent on getting to her brain to change her mind at the source. He meets a number of anthropomorphic items in her bloodstream, including a virus named Astro, who's kind of helpful. <laughs> on the outside is his best friend Harlan, who tried to talk him out of this mission, but stands by ready to help because Lenny took his cell phone with him when he got shot, so he can call. They can talk. They can talk. Of course. It's, it's uh, lots of action and humor to keep the readers interested, and alternating chapters tell the story from three viewpoints, Lenny, Zoe, and Harlan, and any of us who remember Fantastic Voyage, both the book That's and the movie. That's what I was thinking of, yeah. <laughs> we know where this idea possibly came from, but it's great fun. And speaking of Tesla... This is a start of a new series. The series is called The Accelerati, book one. Um, this type, book's title is Tesla's Attic. It's by Neil Schusterman and Eric Elfman. 14-year-old Nick and his family have moved to Colorado Springs from Florida after the death of his mother in a house fire. 
Nick feels guilt for not rescuing his mother who was right behind him as he ran out of the burning house. As Nick enters the attic in his new house, thinking it might be a good room for him, he is hit on the head by a toaster. The attic is full of weird old stuff, so the first thing he does is have a yard sale. Then some strange things begin to happen. Nick and his new friends begin to realize Nick needs to reclaim the items and return them to the attic. Tesla had designed them and left them there. Oh, and by the way, there are some not-so-pleasant people who are also trying to get their hands on the items. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to be a trilogy. I don't know if I said that. Some nonfiction for teens includes The American Dust Bowl by Don Brown. Dan Brown, excuse me. This is a graphic st novel style of nonfiction, and it tells about how <clears throat> how the Dust Bowl came about, some of the terrible effects of the dust storms, and how the land began to recover. Um, they do have two photographs in the back of the book of the dust storm overtaking a city. Okay. One of them fairly recently in like 2011. Yeah, the other one's some from, amazing pictures you've seen out yeah, recently, some, yeah. Especially with the drought all over the country. Oh, well, good point, yes. And this is otherwise conveyed through the graphic novel um, artwork, but it's very well done. Oh, kids are going to love this. Zombie Makers, True mm -hmm. Stories of Nature's Undead by Rebecca L. Johnson. And it tells of animals, mostly bugs, in nature that inject other creatures who then no longer act in their own best interest. In effect, they are zombies. After each example is explained, the author includes a brief, the science behind the story that is um, described by scientists or university professors. It's fascinating and icky, and there are numerous photos, as everyone would want. <laughs> yeah. Benjamin Franklin by Kathleen Kroll is book seven in her Giants of Science series. The conversational tone tells of the life of Benjamin Franklin, who considered science his calling. The author co covers several of his inventions, as well as his political career. His first invention, she said, was flippers for both hands and feet to speed up his swimming. She also mentioned some of his less politically correct opinions that were held at that time. The final chapter, titled Lasting Impact, notes his influence on science and the world, and she states on page 105, the power of electricity changed the world, and Franklin was there to light the spark. I mean, that's perfect. How did she know? And this also includes an index. Kathleen Kroll has also written Lives of the Scientists, which are brief biographies of 20 scientists, including, including Isaac Newton, Ivan Pavlov, George Washington Carver, Marie Curie, uh, Albert Einstein. It has two to five pages for each chapter. It's a great starting place, and again, readers might want to find more detailed information somewhere else, but um, here's a good place to start. Bomb by Steve Scheinken tells of the Manhattan Project and scientists from other nations who assisted. Um, I had confessed during the summer reading program workshops that I started this book twice, just didn't get it read. I, and it's not that it's a bad book, it's a wonderful book. And several librarians told me that their boys in their libraries are all reading it and handing it to each other. As a matter of fact, in the following 2013 awards it received were Excellence in Nonfiction Award, the Newberry Honor Award, and the Cyber Honor. So it's a great book. And one of these days, I really am going to read it. I just, you know. There's a lot of books to get through. There are a lot. And I'm sure it's very well written. I did kind of skim through it, but I didn't get it all done. The interesting thing is it also, it doesn't just talk about the Manhattan Project. It talks about the espionage going on, mm -hmm. people trying to steal our ideas. We tr we're we trying to steal other people's ideas. We're trying to sabotage the Germans who are also trying to build a bomb. So there's lots happening in this book, and I really recommend it, even though I haven't read it, which I rarely do that. Any of the 27 books in the Scientists in the Field series will work for this summer because these are wonderful. I haven't read a bad one yet. There are wonderful books about what scientists are doing and how they're studying their topic, whatever it might be. These are a few new ones that I ran across recently, so these, that's why they're on the list. But any of them, you probably have some in your library already. Wild Horse Scientists by Kay Frydenborg. It's a look at scientists who study the horses on Assateague Island, overseen by two different states, Maryland and Virginia. The preserve is divided, and each state runs things a little bit differently in trying to um, keep a healthy population of the horses on their island. Stronger Than Steel by Bridget Hales. Uh, the, the subtitle says it all, Spider Silk DNA and the Quest for, for Better Bulletproof Vests, mm -hmm. Sutures, 
and parachute rope. Because that's where we're finding it. Yeah, and that stuff is crazy strong. It is crazy yeah. strong. You see that little, you know, small spider, or not so small, some of them. And you wonder. The Tapir Scientist by Cy Montgomery. This one received a starred review from Booklist, and it is about studying tapirs. I didn't read this one. I'm sorry. I read the horse one, though. I read this one, Eruption, Volcanoes and the Science of Saving Lives by Elizabeth Roosh. Good information on, on volcanoes and how the magma forms and how, it, how they do erupt. But it does focus on how modern scientists predict eruptions and how they've gathered information so that when a volcano starts to be doing certain things, they begin to get concerned. This is going to go. And early on in the, when they were doing this, well, not real early on, but at one point they talked about a particular eruption they were sure was going to happen, but they were worried about evacuating all the people because they thought if we're wrong and the people come back, we'll never get them all to leave again. But it turns out they were right and it did erupt. And it has, of course, excellent photos as do all of these books and a, a very popular topic. And I know you already have 1,200 volcano books in your collection, so I, <laughs> but this is a great uh, addition if you have the, the space and the funding for it. The Dolphins of Shark Bay by Pamela S. Turner is about a group of dolphins who frequent a bay in Australia and the scientists that have been studying them. And again, another great topic. Fiction for older teens. We're moving along pretty good. Yep. I can't believe it. This, oh, whoop, I better turn the page. Art, uh, Owen Colfer has a new series titled WARP, W-A-R-P, which stands for something, and I still forgot to look up what it stands for. This is book one, The Reluctant Assassin is the title. 17-year-old Chevron, Chevron Savano, an FBI agent, is not in, Lon in London, oh, let me start over. 17-year-old Chevron Savano, FBI agent, is in London babysitting a time travel pod that hasn't seen action in 10 years. Then things go crazy. Riley, 14, arrives with a dead scientist who was hiding in Victoria, London, 1898. This is, this is your ultimate witness protection program where they've been pe putting people in the past. Yeah, and actually that's what the war, I just looked it up oh, quickly. Thank WARP you. Stand, is an acronym for Witness Anonymous Relocation Program. So See, relocating them to the past I should have read for thank witness protection. Perfect. Great. <laughs> yeah. Riley, who is the 14-year-old coming from Victoria in London, he is certain that Garrick, a killer for hire who basically owns him, will be arriving at any moment because Garrick will not let something like time travel stop him from getting there. The time travel pod basically blew up, blew up mm -hmm. when they arrived. So he's not sure how that guy's going to show up, but he's sure he will. And he did. Excellent story, of course, by Owen Colfer. Erasing Time by C.J. Hill. 18-year-old twins Taylor and Sheridan are pulled into the future, 400 years into the future, and they discover that they, they were pulled there accidentally because the people in that time were trying to get this well-known scientist um, who might help them handle some things that they're dealing with in their government right now. But they are an evil government. And so Taylor and Sheridan have to find a way to keep them from using the time machine again because they're going to keep doing things until they get what they want. So they decide they have to escape beyond the city, this walled city, and they have to trust Echo, who was an interpreter. He's 18. And they don't know really if they can trust him, but he's the one who's going to guide them there. The second book is Echo in Time, and it was out in paperback in December, but I haven't seen it yet. I didn't find a copy of it. Not a Drop to Drink by Mindy McGinnis is a dystopian novel. Lynn is 16, and she and her mother guard their pond, the only dependable source of water in the surrounding area. Mother has taught Lynn will, well, kill those who would take the water, even if they want to sip. But now, smoke from a fire to the east of them heralds a time of change, loss, and recovery, if Lynn truly wants to survive. <clears throat> The first line in the book is, Lynn was nine, the first time she killed to defend the pond. And they're talking about a man. She killed a man at nine years old because her mother was so intent on them protecting the water. But Lynn goes through quite a bit of change during the course of the book. We, was that book on a previous list? I seem to remember it. Ooh. Maybe I heard about it from somewhere else. Oh, I bet I talked about it in my best books of the year. Okay, that I bet that was yes, it. Yes, because I'm like, I've heard it because I pulled it in here because of, <laughs> of the, the change in the in the 
environment mm -hmm. in there. Right. The 100 by Cass Morgan. The last humans have been orbiting Earth for many years in a space station type home. And on this place, because they're so closely confined, breaking any kind of rule is a criminal activity. So even if you're home late, if they catch you, you go to jail. Now the Chancellor has decided that 100 teens being held in confinement, many of them age 17, when you turn 18 you get murdered, well, killed by the government. They will be dropped to Earth to hopefully survive and send back data to prove that the Earth is livable again. This is Shades of a Penal Colony crossed with Lord of the Flies. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I missed it, but I understand the CW series just premiered a right. week yeah, or so there ago. Is, I think they're on their second or third episode, yeah. So I haven't seen that yet, but I'm going to have to try and catch it. It was a, a good book, and I'm sure there will be more books to follow along with the series on TV. All the Right Stuff by Walter Dean Myers. Um, the summer after his absence, absentee father is killed in a random shooting, Paul, 16, works at a Harlem soup kitchen where he listens to lessons about the social contract from Elijah, an elderly African-American man who really wants him to pick up on this whole idea and go with it. And so Elijah not only talks with him about it, but he'll talk with him a little bit and then he'll say, think about that tonight and then we'll talk again tomorrow. And then other times he sends them to talk to somebody else. So he's really working on this. And it's really kind of a book list called it expository material that, that is successful because it is dramatized by the characters. In between these times with Elijah, um, the boy whose name I just spaced out, Paul, he's also mentoring a 17-year-old unwed mother who wants to get a basketball scholarship to go to college. So there's some of their interaction. And, and some of his interactions with other people. And it's uh, really something, I don't think kids will pick it up and just read it this summer. Maybe they will, but I see it more as something that the teachers could use. Mm -hmm. But it is about the social contract and about social sciences. See how I made that work? <laughs> okay, we're going to move on a little bit now. Do we want to go to the other? Sure, I can put you right onto the website now. Okay. We're going to go to the website because for Nebraska librarians anyway, I'm very excited to show you, whoa, we go to the search here and type in performers. And the first thing that should come up, I had to click on that, yeah. I can't just hit, is Nebraska Library Program Performers Database, which just recently went live like last month. So here's the opening page. <clears throat> and I'll just point out that over here, it says library submit performers you would recommend. No one is going to go on our Nebraska Performers Database unless a librarian in Nebraska has seen their performance and recommends them. So if performers send me information, I'm not putting them in unless somebody says, these guys were great. Mm -hmm. So you can either browse all, of, all the entries so far, which we had 10 before, maybe we're up to like 15. It's slow, but it's, it's getting better. So you can, you can search that way, or you can search by keyword. I put in magician, and nothing came up. It's because, I'll explain that in a minute. But we do have one person who does magic on the list, and I'll explain that in a minute. But first I'm going to put in science here, because that's our theme. Mm -hmm. Type in science for keyword, and go. And look, we have several. Edgerton Explorate Center, EGAD mm -hmm. Science. Mad Science of Iowa, for those people who in the western part, or eastern, excuse me, I don't know my direction, <laughs> eastern part of the state, Mrs. Science, who's out of Palmyra. And so for some of them, like from Mrs. Science, I went to her webpage and, and pulled out this, this that says ages 3 to, to 103, so I marked her right away as for teens, children, and families. Some of them don't have those marked yet. And, because we haven't gotten all the information. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of information here. And some of them don't have a description yet because we have to just go pull that information out. It's or, a manual process done by humans, so there <laughs> it's we a go. work in progress. But we're really excited to have this yeah. pulled together so that people can look at it and say, well, um, here's someone from Pella, Iowa, that might work for me. Or here's someone from Omaha. We're trying to get some more from other parts of the state. I know there are some exciting. Ooh, here's Hardington Public Library recommended the Edgerton Explorate Center out of Aurora. So that's a little bit further west. Yeah. This is great to have this database. I know I see sometimes on our system mailing list people 
randomly will say, hey, we had this great presenter or speaker come and do this, or we're having someone come in, and if anyone else would like to schedule them to also travel to other nearby libraries in the same day or in a nearby day. Um, but it's always so random. You never know when right. something's going to come up on there or someone's going to share something. And somebody might have worked perfectly for you, but you've already filled all your days with other things, right. which is great. You've got your schedule done. When I was in, I think in Scott, no, Gary, someone said, are you going to do authors? I said, oh, mm -hmm. I suppose we that's could. a possibility. Yeah. So suggest, send me suggestions, send me ideas. Um, we're going to expand this a little bit. Right now, this is the information that we have. See here, we have under Edgerton that the cost is $300 plus one-way mileage, but shared mileage with two or more libraries. That's the kind of information mm -hmm. that you were just talking about. Right, a lot so of you know, performers and the authors will say, I'll cut you a deal if you can find a couple more locations for me to, hit, to go to in that same um, uh, yeah. day or day or two. Yeah. So your town might have them in the morning, and then, then the next town down the road might have them in the afternoon, and then you're sharing the expenses of the mileage, which is great. Yeah. So I, I wanted to show this a little bit so people can see that it's up, it's live, you can do some searching. Now, we do have, I'll show you what happens. I just typed in magic, so I have, oh, I should, maybe I should have done magician. I think we have two people that talk about magic, oh, several. Most of them don't have much of a, of a description yet, so... Mm -hmm. I think in the description part, the word magician would have come up, and that's mm -hmm. then I would have found something when I was talking about magic. So use the keywords, but try several versions of the word. Magic, yeah. magician, clowns. I don't know what would be go with clowns. We have one <laughs> clown in there that I know of. Um, there's quite a few magicians, though, and those are science. Oh, they probably thought I still wanted the science. That might be something that happens. Oh, uh, yeah, we have things to... Um, to fix with it but anyway I just wanted to show you how to get here how to do a little searching what might come up and where to submit performers you would recommend so they're titled you get mm -hmm. science or something if you have it you don't have to fill all this in because we will do some looking but if you have this information that saves us some time you hit submit and um, we do a little double checking and it'll go up on the web page so you can see Oh, it's somewhere bad now. Oh, that's yeah, that right. opened it's up a separate, new, separate yeah. window. Now, another one more quick thing, and then we're really yeah. done. I want to go to the CSLP, CSLPreads.org. This is the Collaborative Summer Library Program webpage, and it has lots of information. Um, okay, so let's let's just check. What are upcoming programs? Upcoming. 2000, first 2014. 2015, Every Hero Has a Story, Unmask, and the adult theme is Escape the Ordinary. So see, I was right. Yeah. <laughs> but the best thing about this page, I'll go back to the beginning, is right over here where it says Create Account. If you haven't done this yet, click on here, create your account. You have to come up with, um, you have to put in some who you are, but you're going to have to come up with a username and a password. And then you can, you know, and verify those and fill in these other blanks and then register. What that does is it lets you log in after you're um, accepted. You can type in your username and your password anytime you want to and you get into some more things. I'm just going to click back here again. When you log in, another line like this one shows up down here. And there are things that you can use that the average person who comes to this page isn't, isn't accessible to them. Any public librarian in Nebraska can create an account. School librarians can also create an account. They'll just take a little longer because the person who handles these contacts me to make sure that you're um, either in a, in a community that doesn't have a public library or you're partnering with your public library so that you're sharing together and nobody's um, having the program uh, at, the at the expense of the other place, if that makes sense. So cslpreads.org, and you can get to the, the CSLP um, webpage, and you can learn about next year's program, the year after that, and what we're going to be voting on next week when I go to Biloxi, Mississippi, for our annual meeting. 
And that's all I have for today. And I didn't even ask if there were any questions. Were there any questions? Um, no, there weren't any questions throughout the show. But um, there was, um, Laura Hess from our Stanton Public Library did say she loved the hair. Oh. <laughs> that scientist hair that you're wearing. At the well, I had to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Sally. It's always great to have the, our annual check-in to what titles you need to get a hold of for the summer reading program. So hopefully everyone got their info and will be prepared. Um, as you're mentioning throughout the show, and if you notice she was reading off a sheet here, um, the handout is available in the show notes. It's already been bookmarked. It's on our website, so you'll have access to that afterwards. So you have a full list of all the author's titles and all the descriptions from that that you can get. Um, and the PowerPoint slides will be up as well, and links to all these web pages, the, um, the CSLP page and the library performer database that we have. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, and I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is a pause to read at Kearney Public Library. Yay. Um, this is, uh, many libraries have done this, um, academic, public, um, bringing in therapy dogs into the library. Um, academic libraries do it a lot during um, finals week when students are stressed the most. <laughs> um, this, yeah, this is a particular program with the, um, Therapy Dogs Inc. in Kearney, Nebraska, where it helps um, the children read with the dogs to help improve their literacy skills and become more comfortable with reading. Um, so we'll have um, Christine Walsh from Kearney Public Library and Kimberly Will Williams, who's from the local uh, Therapy Dogs, Inc. in Kearney, to talk about how they run that program at their library. Um, unfortunately, and I asked, they're not going to bring any of the dogs. Oh. <laughs> None of the puppies will be here. Um, it'll just be a you know, presentation. No. Oh. <laughs> that will still be good, but still a puppy would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll join us next week for that. Um, if you are a uh, Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so please do go ahead there and like us on Facebook, and you'll get notifications of when new shows are coming up, when the recording is available. Reminder, as you can see this morning, of when the, today's show is about ready to start, so you can hop in if you want to on the fly. So like us on Facebook if you are a Facebook user. Other than that, thank you very much for attending this morning, and we'll see you next week on the show. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.